This is CHSR 97.9 FM here in Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada, and you're listening to Python's Paradise, your film and music show. And this is your host, Greg Gilbert, a.k.a. the Python Hyena. And folks, I'm going local today. I'm going to be talking to somebody that's kind of had a, a similar upbringing in music as me, as, plus as he's kind of from right around my generation. And we're going to uh, share our enthusiasm for music as well as a movie that uh, he was involved in in Moncton, which uh, starred one of the actresses I have had interviewed on here back in 2015. I'm talking about a local DJ and, uh, as far as I'm concerned, a music mastermind, in my opinion. Wow. <laughs> I'm, ta- wow. I'm talking about Rob Pinnock. Is that, did I get your last name right? Uh, Pinnock, but yeah, Pinnock. yeah, you're 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 right. I, I I think I think the Pinnock is just the I C K uh, sound on the end of the name is just something that's just kind of uh, evolved over years is, since since we've landed in Canada. <laughs> wow, mm. you know you you go by Uncle Rob on your yeah uh, I do yeah on but, the what, box. yeah what where where did you come up with the name Uncle Rob? I don't know when I first uh, when I when I first uh, joined on to the Fox team, I was I was uh, doing the evening show, and uh, I was probably considerably older at the time than my average uh, uh, the average age of my listenership. So so I just kind of went with the uncle, just kind of a I don't know. Everybody's got that uncle, right? That that uh, you know had all the cool records and 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 kind of served up some sort of musical education. Everybody's had one of those in their family at one point or another, pretty much, anyway. So I, I just thought the uncle kind of stuck and, and, and kind of worked. And, and, I, and for, fortunately, it did stick. And, uh, you know, um, it, it's, 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 I kind of wish I thought about it a little longer, you know, to maybe come up with something a little more uh, imaginative or creative. But it's simple. Uh, people remember it easily. Uh, which was kind of what I was going for. It's almost like, as, as soon as you give yourself a nickname, you auto- automatically, to a degree, become a character. So, you know, uh, I was trying to uh, to start that and then develop the persona from there. But uh, if if you give them uh, a name they can kind of, when I say they, the listeners uh, can kind of latch on to, I think that's kind of a foot in the door in making that happen. So I, I just thought it was a cool nickname that would that would kind of suit me. Kind of like where I go by Python here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that's that's quite a handle too. You know, Python. I, Python. I should have went with that. Python <laughs> Pinnock. They would have been pretty, pretty boss. Well, the python and the hyena, or, t- or the yeah. spotted hyena, are two of my favorite animals, and I love African wildlife. But they're also two animals that are often so misunderstood because so many mm-hmm. people hate them, but they don't realize the benefit they are to the environment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I I wasn't aware of of that either. To the environment. Well, you know, snakes. I I read someplace they kill more uh, rodents and pests than oh, okay, yeah. uh, birds of prey and cats. Okay. Which kind of surprised me that they killed more than birds, but they do. Mm-hmm. And the spotted hyena, they they say, would be right at home in a sewer because they go around the plains of Africa and they basically devour anything that the is scavengers yeah and okay. they'll even eat the uh, the bone wow <laughs> yeah so i i find that they're very misunderstood and it kind of reminds me of myself because uh often growing up i was misunderstood as well okay all right yeah okay so, fair enough yeah cool. But uh, I know that uh, you had had a show here at CHSR. Um, oh, years ago, yeah, yeah. I got I got my start in radio at CHSR. What what what, what uh, years was you here? I don't think you mm. were here when I was here. No, probably not. Uh, we're going back quite a ways. Uh, I, I had a few different terms there. Uh, when I was a journalism student, uh, my first tenure there. Uh, was part of uh, a job placement, like a practicum, to give you experience, and and uh, I, I was parachuted in uh, for uh, I think six weeks, uh, January into February of '86, to uh, work the newsroom. <laughs> Excuse me. 
and that was my that was my first crack at a regular on air gig. So that's where I started. Uh, from there, I went. Uh, well, I, I I I graduated from school and and started at uh, at uh, a commercial station in town. Uh, but I always missed uh, doing my own show and bringing in my own records. So, you know, a few years once I got into that career, I, I went back to CHSR for a couple of years. That would have been uh, from 89 to about, oh, I don't know, 92, 93, somewhere around there. And uh, I went back and uh, even did uh, uh, a brief stint of about a year or so, um, probably around mid-90s as well. So I, I've had a couple of uh, different terms there. What was what was the name of the show you did? Oh, the one that uh, probably lasted longest uh, was a show I co-hosted with my friend Chris Votor, who was another. Uh, I, I believe he was a, a former PD there back in the mid or maybe even closer to the early '80s. Um, we did a show called Two Hours of Recorded Music." Uh, it was uh, just basically an open format show. We tried to write some stuff. We uh, tried to, because uh, because uh, at the time, I was doing uh, work in an advertising department uh, when we were doing that show, and that gave me access to my own studio. So often we would go into my studio, and uh, after hours, and 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 create uh, uh, some things that we would use uh, for the show up there. So yeah, um, we we tried to write some some well, I, I guess comedy. Uh, or satire, uh, and and play some music and just have opinionated banter with one another. And I guess that was our thing. Uh, we won a Barry Award, I think, back in 1992 for that show for best open format. Oh, fantastic! Yeah. I, I'm hoping to get a Barry Award eventually. I'm looking. I got nominated last year for best spoken word show. And okay. this year, I don't know what the nominees are yet, but mm -hmm. um, I'm hoping to get nominated. They opened up a new category for best interview, and I could not resist uh, oh, sure. <laughs> going after that. Yeah, yeah. well, it's kind of your thing, right? Well, I, I've been reviewing movies since 1996, and I started mm -hmm. here in 2005, mm -hmm. and, but, um, and you know, I, I still do the film reviews, you know? I, I, yeah. I haven't stopped that, but once I started... Uh, doing these interviews in 2015 it's like man i enjoy doing this and i think the audience likes us more too yeah well that's cool man and i, I think the key to a good interview is to uh, make it a conversation and i think we're off to a good start there yeah well it's interesting because speaking of music uh friday night i had murphy dunn on from the blues brothers <laughs> wow yeah wow. so is he a brother to duck dunn no, he's not. Unfortunately, Duck Dunn is gone too. Uh, he, he yes, he is. But he, but he was part of that. Uh, he was part of that uh, Blues Brothers band too, was he not? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. I had uh, Murphy Dunn on here um, um, Friday night and and uh, talking about that because I think the Blues Brothers, in my opinion, probably the greatest movie to come out of Saturday Night Live. With yeah, yeah, I I I'd, I'd agree with that. With Wayne's World a close second, but I say Blues Brothers mm -hmm. takes top honors because it's such a celebration of blues music and blues yeah. artists. Well, those 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 two guys, uh, Ackroyd and Belushi, they love their blues. Like, uh, so yeah, it, it, it was totally genuine and sincere, I believe. It was kind of funny because I I was going to a late New Year's party yesterday. Mm -hmm. Somebody was got people together yesterday because it was the best time for her to do it, and she invited right. me, and I was standing in line, Tim Hortons, to get Tim Pitts to bring him. My phone rang, and I looked at the phone, it said, Murphy Dunn. Wow. wow. Yeah, well, he wanted to know what my mailing address was because he wanted to send me an autographed picture, and I was like, okay. Well, that's really nice. Yeah, right on. Yeah, he was pretty cool, you know, but... Um, but uh, that was one of the great uh, uh, examples of music and movies, and uh, oh yeah, and uh, just the way they placed all those artists throughout the movie. You know, Cab Calloway, James Brown, Ray Charles, Aretha Franklin, John Lee Hooker, and the whole bunch. It was just fantastic. Yeah, yeah, no question about it. But you went uh, from here. You went to the Fox after, right? Well. Uh... Uh, I 
I actually left radio for a couple of years to pursue acting uh, full time. So uh, I kind of uh, started uh, with a clean slate back in uh, in late 2000. That's when I really joined the Fox. Okay. Well, we're uh, going to get to the the your, the Reaper here in a minute, but uh, yeah. But but uh, how did it come for you to to get on with the Fox? Oh, uh, well, uh, again, like uh, the Fox is pretty much uh, a station that uh, came out of uh, uh, the same company that I was employed with before. So they, 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 they were familiar with me and my work, and uh, they thought I was a good fit. They knew I was a music guy. Um, Tom Blizzard, who was the program director at the time, and uh, very much a mentor for me uh, in radio, uh, we, we had a great relationship, and uh, and I, I, I think uh, as soon as a, a place came or a position came available that I was a good fit for, uh, he, he he gave me a call, and I thank him for that. Wow, you know it's something it's that good, good timing, good timing, really. Good timing. Uh, I, I I just had that on my side. Here's something I, I gotta ask you about since since you're in the the commercial radio. I, I, I need I need to understand something and I think I think you could probably mm-hmm. bring some understanding. When okay. I I started here at CHSR, one of the things I wanted to do, like one of the things I love to do is p- play music that I never really get to hear on the radio. Sure. And I remember I called um a couple of radio stations before I joined CHSR and uh, and um I I requested um I remember I requested, I requested a song by Avril Lavigne called "Together," which I absolutely okay. loved, yeah. and uh, they wouldn't play it. Which station was it? I actually don't remember. Because if it was if it was the Fox, Avril Lavigne, little little on the soft side for us. Uh, we are more of a rock station. We do have to be true to that brand. I guess early on for her first cur- for her first uh, full length album, I, I think she did get. A little bit of crossover support, but really, she's considered more of a pop artist right now. So, if you were calling the Fox, you were probably calling the wrong station to try to get an Avril Lavigne song on. Um, I'm not even familiar with that track. What year did that come out? I think it was '04 with the Under the yeah. Skin album. And I remember I requested a song by the Cars called "Cruiser." Cruiser. Yeah. Which album is that on? I don't even know that one. That was on. Uh, let me think. I was almost tempted. Pan- I think. I think it's it Panorama or Candio. I think it's Shake It Up. I think. Oh, it could be Shake It Up. All right. Yeah, Shake It Up. Yeah, all right. And, and they and they wouldn't play that. And well, they might not have even had that. You know, a lot of radio stations. Uh, Especially when we're getting back into older album, albums, have, uh, have have like a lot of things that were sent to the stations. Generally, were singles, and uh, not every full album. Uh, I, like I can speak firsthand knowledge. I know we don't have the Shake It Up album in our library. Okay. Like uh, it, it, it was never sent to us uh, after the switch over to to uh, to CD. Uh, and and years ago, we pretty much purged uh, all the old vinyl, so might have had it at one time. But I can guarantee you, the Fox does not have a copy of that right now. Okay, you know, it, 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 it probably just came down to that. And plus, you know, we are uh, we are a, a, a gold based uh, uh, hit radio station too, right? So you know, we, we don't dive into into things too much that, that, you know, really weren't released as singles. I'm pretty sure that one wasn't, was it? Uh, I don't think it was, but I, yeah. I, I guess the thing I'm trying to understand is when yeah. you got like 10 or 12 songs on an album, I'm like, yeah. like, you got songs that never get played, and I'm wondering, like, why record them if they're not going to get airplay? Like, I never well, understood that. Because guys like you like them. I guess you know. I mean, uh, the singles are just like calling cards for, or at least at one time, were calling cards for, for a, 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 a bigger, a grander statement, which was the album itself. Um, but uh, you know, we're we're uh, we we don't 
break a lot of new artists. I mean, like, or we don't break a lot of new material. We we pretty much go with the uh, with the the tried and true uh, hits of the past as far as our gold goes. Um, really, to uh, to uh, dig off uh, an album track off a, off an album that's thirty one years old. You know, when when chances are. You know, the Shake It Up uh, single would be the one that most people are familiar with. You know, uh, that's the thing about radio and radio listenership. Uh, people like comfort zones. People like familiarity. And that's what we do uh, try to serve up for the most part. Of course, there's going to be exceptions like yourself that would like to hear something a little deeper on the album. But really, your average listener pretty much wants to hear the stuff they can hum along and sing along with, really. And, 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 and that is true. Well, I remember when I started here in 2005, I remember I the first thing I played was the, the Avril Lavigne track, and I actually use it to open my show when I do a live show now, because mm -hmm. I, I know when Crazy Train, I, I got inspired because they play the Ozzy Osbourne track before um, their show airs, and I kind of like, I kind of want to use this song, because Chantal Kraviazic wrote it, and Avril mm -hmm. sings it, and uh, it kind of spoke to me in a lot of ways about mm -hmm. uh, individuality and um, so I played it and I thought it was a better song than some of the stuff that they released as singles on that album <laughs> well that often is the case you know I mean but uh, you know um, generally comes down to whether we have it or not you know in, in, in many cases uh, like I say radio stations at least commercial ones these days like back in the '70s and '80s, like everything got sent to the radio station at one time, or radio stations. But now they just pretty much service us with singles, really, for the most part. So, okay, no, no, I, I just needed to understand that because um, I, I, I know sometimes you know you, you can hear a song once or twice, mm -hmm. and then once it's played so many times, you, you kind of get sick of it. Yeah, and yeah. and you know that. That's that's uh, if if someone has a comment about uh, a radio station, uh, usually ninety percent of the times that's what it is. But uh, again, we uh, we do try to deal with comfort zones. We do try to serve up stuff that people do know, because generally that's what the greater proportion of listeners want to hear. To be honest with you. Okay. Well, you know. Um you know, uh, go, go, going back to uh, when you uh, got on the radio, like, um, mm -hmm. what was the kind of, uh, like, I know you're a music lover, so yeah. what was the kind of music that you loved growing up? Oh, growing up? Um, oh, I've been buying records for a long time. Um, back in the 70s, I liked uh, things that were, you know, bordering on hard rock, almost like glam on my first... Uh, my first favorite artists were uh, groups like The Sweet, uh, Alice Cooper, Oh yeah, uh, Kiss, yeah, things like that. Like I loved comic books when I was a kid too. So when you had uh, you know these uh, musicians that come kind of almost with a comic book or 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 definitely at least personas uh, attached to them, it was a it was a natural kind of. Uh, Thing for me to latch on to. Uh, Bowie was another early or early uh, influence. Uh, I had older brothers, so you know I listened to a lot of uh, stuff that they would be listening to, like uh, like Pink Floyd and Grand Funk and and Deep Purple and stuff like that. So um, uh, I don't know. I I, I think the stuff <laughs> going around on Facebook uh, in the last few days has been your top ten albums of your teen years. And actually, I think uh, going back, I made a, a teen years list and a preteen years list. And I think my preteen years list probably stands up better than my teen years list for the most part, as far as, you know, lasting heritage classic material goes. Oh, is that post still on Facebook? Well, I mean, everybody's doing one, right? Like, uh, it's, it's, I, I must have read 50 lists this weekend from various people doing their, you know, these are the 10 albums of my teenage years. Like, I did a list, and I, I didn't limit it to 10 albums. I pretty much uh, just made a massive list. Wow. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, But, yeah, a lot of people are doing it. Well, this particular weekend, anyway, it seems to be the hot thing to do online, or on Facebook, anyway. 
<laughs> I was on Facebook a lot this week, but but um, music, I mean, it just just takes you back. And um, a lot yeah. of the bands that you had mentioned that uh, I grew up with as well, like I was born in 1972, so I remember some of this stuff uh, mm -hmm. uh, growing up. Um, I just got, I got, uh, my, this might be a hard question for you to answer, but I want to okay. see if you know. Do you remember the first artist and song you ever played on the air? When you... I do. Oh, okay. Like, when, when, when I went to, uh, like, when I went to Sea High and did my first shift, uh, it, it wasn't really anything that I I, I picked out particularly for my show. It was just like it was a, a, a rotating cue card kind of uh, system where, you know, the next card up in the category would be the one you'd play, and when you play it, you put it to the back of the category. Like, this is this is pre uh, any sort of uh, uh, computerized database. You know, th this is going back to when we still queued up, you know, vinyl records, and you had to have the next one ready to go when when the, the one you were playing was finished, you know. It was no, like, uh, setting up a playlist for five or six songs and walking away and coming back uh, when it was done to say something. It was it was, it was, was very involved. Uh, but uh, the first one that I did uh, play on my show was a Small Town Boy by the Bronsky Beat. Oh, great song. I still listen to them. That, that was the first uh, official song that ushered in my career. They also sang uh, "Hit That per Perfect." Um, oh, "Hit That." Uh. Yes, they had a few things, uh, but that that was probably their biggest charting single. Yeah. But I, I do remember that. I do remember the first song I played on the air because I made a point of you know making a mental note of that because uh, hey, that's the first song I, for for this very reason. I, I I thought there might come a day when I would want to know what the first song I played was. So I've always kind of tucked that away. So yeah, Bronsky beat "Small Town Boy." Well, and I, yeah, and I was a small town boy too. So, <laughs> hey, yeah, they're they're a British band, aren't they? Oh yeah, very. Oh, okay, yeah. No, I I like small town town boy, um, Bronski beat. That, that that's a great tune. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all right. It's pretty good. Yeah, but um, yeah, you. Uh, I gotta say, I was mentioning. I think I don't know whether it was Murphy Dunn. I'd mentioned this too, but. Mm -hmm. My parents still have an eight-track player. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and then they went to vinyl and cassettes yeah. and CDs. And I was like, in my opinion, I think vinyl probably sounds the best. And do you think that I would might... agree. Yeah? Do you think that's why it's making a comeback? Well, I think there's a number of reasons. Uh, uh, I think vinyl, yes, does sound good. I think, there's, I th I think there, there, there is a retro uh, attraction that's involved you know um, I think when people have a bunch of uh, uh, music files stored on their hard drive I, I really am hard-pressed to ever consider that a collection really it's just a num uh, a bunch of files made up of you know bits and bytes right mm -hmm. uh, as far as um, a record you know you can you people people that are into vinyl, like really take care of it. They kind of curate collections. Um, the artwork is 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 way more impressive on the twelve inch format. Yeah. Um, anybody that grew up with records uh, knows what it was like to like, you know, just pour over the liner notes and read it all and 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 take it all in. And you know, I think there's a there's a real there's a real uh, involvement uh, with with uh, putting a record on. I think music uh, as a as someone listening to music. I think uh, strictly on their hard drive or whatever. I think you can almost feel a detachment to the music as opposed to an attachment. And uh, and you know what? I think I think in my heart of hearts mm -hmm. that turntable technology is amazing okay you know the the fact that that little diamond tip needle sits in a groove and reads the walls of that groove and interprets that as as vibrations which translate into sound which moves up the stylus and like that's that's magic to me it's not like uh, 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 
a laser, uh, a laser beam reading uh, code off a disk. There's, that, that, there's no magic there, but I think there's a real magic with. Uh, I, I think it's incredible technology. I, I, I'm, I'm just blown away that it was ever invented. You know, it, it, it just, it's, it, it, it still boggles my mind. You know, you mentioned like album covers and stuff, and I remember I mentioned the Cars earlier. I've got yeah. everything the Cars have done, and they had some great artwork on their albums. They sure did, yeah. Uh, especially Candio. I love a great that album cover. That's no, that's that's nice artwork. That's uh, and and the, and the debut album with the girl peeking out through the the windshield through the uh, steering wheel, like that that's that's real neat composition. Uh, I I think the cars made made great uh, album covers as well. I love the cars. I I I am I'm, I'm sitting back wondering when are they going to get into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? <laughs> yeah, they they didn't make it yet, eh? I don't like, think I, I've so. I've kind of lost track of uh, this Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I don't know. Uh, I'm sure it's an honor for everybody in there, but there's so many people that have been, you know, bypassed uh, or or not even considered that I don't know. I, I really, I really question, you know, the honor to a degree. Uh, heavy metal, heavy metal has totally been uh, snubbed by that hall, and you know, especially when you're talking about, you know, into the '80s and stuff like that. That stuff was huge. That yep. stuff was huge. So and 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 you know we're talking big big selling artists internationally yep. that uh, have have not even got a lick of attention from the the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. You know it's funny because uh, you probably remember this as well as I do um, when MTV took over. You know and uh, mm-hmm. and uh, the MTV thing uh, happened and and music videos came on and uh, yeah that I'm, changed a lot of things. It changed a lot of things and. Um, I, I've got a lot of memories of some of the artists I grew up listening to. You know, The Cars, Huey Lewis and the News, Pat mm-hmm. Benatar, Cindy Lauper, Madonna, mm-hmm. people yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, it, yeah I, I agree. The, those those people, uh, especially the early days in, in, in video when it was so new, and it, it was such a wild frontier, it was so exciting because think of the, think of the doors that yep. uh, that that opened up with music video and uh, MTV and and much music a couple of years later in Canada, you know, not everybody even had a video when MTV launched. So you were getting all these newer acts that you know had the foresight to come up with uh, with videos because there was a demand, there was a need uh, to, to to feed the programming. So you know. There was a lot of exciting new acts all of a sudden showing up and getting massive exposure. Like think of uh, think of you know prior to to video outlets on TV, uh, touring is a very expensive enterprise uh, to get to uh, you know different markets and 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 you know get your face in front of people and get people to see and listen to you and therefore get interested in your records enough to sell them, well, all of a sudden that dynamic has changed because you're being beamed into into living rooms. You know, you, you don't necessarily have to uh, sell your soul to underwrite a, 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 a major tour if you've, uh, you know, invested a few thousand into a, a, a good, catchy video, something that was, you know, you were going to get exposure and probably uh, enviable exposure to a lot of the artists that would uh, go on tour. I was so, gonna know, s- it, it changed the dynamic drastically, for sure. I was going to say, one of my favorite artists of the of that time, and he's still one of my favorite artists of that mm-hmm. time, was Weird Al Yankovic, and I yeah. don't hear him on radio very often. No, Why not is really. that? Why is that? Well, yeah. he, he is generally a novelty artist, uh, and and really, he he was. Uh, if you're if you're a Weird Al fan, I think you'd have to agree. He is kind of uh, video focused. You know, a lot of the 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 comedy in in what he does uh, came out in video. Uh, especially as he's starting to spoof more artists, right? Yeah. So uh, I I don't know. I mean. Uh, 
we don't play a lot of novelty records, uh, and 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 I'm not I'm not like uh, putting down Weird Al at all. He's, he's he's an immensely talented and very smart guy, but uh, I I I put him in novelty artist categories because you know if when 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 we're dealing with current hits, we're playing them, you know, uh, on a five or six hour rotation, uh, and and that's a regular song. Uh, you tell a joke five or six times a day, and it's not so funny anymore. And I think that's the that's the risk. Excuse me, that Weird Al runs into with with his material, is that it is funny, but it it kind of has a burn factor. Like once you hear it so many times, it's not as funny anymore. So you know you're probably not going to add Weird Al uh, to a to a regular. Uh, rotation just because I think the joke would get old pretty quick. Yeah, um, I was gonna say sense? say when reviewing movies, um, music, uh, especially soundtracks, are playing a big part in selling oh, yeah. movies today. And I'm gonna tell you, there are times when I'll watch a movie and I'll be taken back, like way back in my memory with soundtracks and I'll give you a couple examples one was Rock of Ages which I think is an underrated great movie uh, I thought Tom Cruise was fantastic in it but there was one scene in the movie that just took me back where oh, yeah. um, where uh, Julian Howe and um, I forget the name of the actor was in the record store and they had all these vinyl records and they were singing um, Jukebox Hero and I Love Rock and Roll which I, I loved how they synced these songs all together too, and in, mm -hmm. uh, in the in the movie. But when they were going through the record store, I was like making mental notes of some of the vinyl records. I mean, I saw Candy O, but the Cars was even in yeah. there if you sp spotted that. And uh, that one took me back. And another one I saw this year was um, Everybody Wants Some, which was the new Richard Linklater movie. Mm -hmm. which I actually went to nine times in theaters, and we only had it two weeks, and I loved it. <laughs> I went to nine times. <laughs> okay, what was the premise of that one? That, Everybody wants some. Um, I, 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 I vaguely remember that title, or, or maybe even watching the trailer, but I, I, I need to be refreshed. Well, Richard Linkletter made Dazed and Confused back yes. in 1993, and the story was set in the 1970s. Yes. Well, um, everybody wants some as a spiritual sequel to it. Only okay. it's like spiritual, meaning it's uh, not the same characters, but yeah. it's set in 1980 and that last weekend, long weekend before college starts, and you follow these characters throughout what they're doing um, before they go to class, like uh, the places they go and whatnot. And mm -hmm. it starts out with my Sharona by the knack. And it just oh, keeps going through, and all I actually ordered the soundtrack online after watching the movie, and every song took me back to that part of my childhood and upbringing because I remember, and uh, that movie did it so well, and it um, I think Linkletter made a note in the in the CD about how he uses music to express certain things and bring back certain uh, parts of uh, his uh, uh, memory as well. Yes. You still there? Yep. Okay, I just dropped the phone there for a second. <laughs> uh, yeah, I love the soundtrack for Days to Confused, and and it, it's funny that uh, um, songs that uh, uh, are, are as old as some of those are, I, I still associate it with uh, different scenes in, in the movie itself. Uh, you know, it Dazed and Confused kind of took ownership of, of a lot of these great old songs and kind of uh, gave them a whole new life as far as I'm concerned. And, uh, yeah, um, it's funny you mentioned My Sharona. That's, that's my favorite guitar solo of all time, My Sharona. Did Bert you... Navar or Avare, or however they say his name. Uh, and and that's that's one of the great things about him. I don't even know exactly how to pronounce his name, but I think he made one of the best or the best guitar solo in rock history. That's my, that's that's my thought. Oh wow! Did you hear I, the I, Did you hear I the Weird that. Al version of that? My Bologna or something like that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember when that came out for sure. Yeah, man. Uh, that, that's taken me back to my high school days when that came out. 
<laughs> Only he used uh, the... Um, oh, why am I pausing on the instrument he used? That thing he grabs a hold of and spreads apart. Uh, why am I... Uh, oh, that's an accordion. Accordion. That yeah. was... I can't believe I couldn't think of that. <laughs> yeah, I, a, he didn't use a guitar solo. He used an no, accordion. No, no, no. He... <laughs> Uh, his, his his dad was a very famous, a uh, famous accordion player too, right? Yeah. Like a Grammy a Grammy winning accordion player, if you can imagine such a thing. Yeah, but yeah, soundtracks are, are are very big. I mean, Saturday Night Fever was, I think, another one of the great soundtracks. You know, with uh, what were some of your favorite soundtracks? Hmm. Well, um, let's see. Uh, like I really wasn't a big, uh, a big disco guy or anything like that. And, uh, so Saturday Night Fever didn't do much for me. That's one of the big ones I remember growing up. Uh, great movie though. <laughs> yeah. Great movie. Great movie. Uh, Grease was another big soundtrack when I was growing up, but I, I didn't really gravitate towards that either. Um, uh, I think soundtracks, uh, when I think of great soundtracks, I think of, you know, uh, Ones that really, really uh, kind of paint a picture with the movie. I, I think Train Spotting is a great uh, example of a fantastic soundtrack. I've got that. Um, yeah. uh, the aforementioned Dazed and Confused, I do think that's an amazing soundtrack, just because it serves the film so well. Yeah. Uh, in the 80s, though, uh, there, was a, there was a lot of big soundtracks in the 80s. Yeah, yeah, some of the ones I have home, like I, I've got tra- I've got Train Spotting, and mm-hmm. uh, yep, uh, Fast Times at Ridgemont High had a really oh, yeah. good. Oh yeah, hey, that's a good one. That that is a good one. I do like that one. That's a great movie. I love Fast Times at Ridgemont High. That's a fantastic movie. Yeah, I was happy. I had Amanda Wiz on here um, last year. She was the girl that played Judge Reinhold's girlfriend in the film. Oh, no kidding, really? Yeah, she was wow. in. A, she was in a Nightmare on Elm Street. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So I, I, I'm hoping to get her on again to celebrate the 35th anniversary of Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Because, Wouldn't that be something? Yeah, I, I would love to. I'd love to get some people from that movie because yeah. uh, I had some great music and everything that happened in that movie was relevant when I was in high school, which mm-hmm. wasn't long after that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, there you go. Uh, Heavy Metal's another great soundtrack. Oh, I've got that movie, too. Yeah, that's got a fantastic soundtrack. Uh, as as we discuss the topic more, I'm thinking of more. Um, yeah, um, uh, Princess Bat Dance was a good movie soundtrack. I thought. Okay. Um, I don't know. Um, I, I I think the ones I mentioned would probably be my favorites. You mentioned Train Spotting. There's a sequel coming out to that this year, and why do I get the feeling we're not going to get it? <laughs> Yeah, uh, probably not. How sad is that? Because look at the... Uh, uh, we didn't even get the original here, but no. it, I, I saw it at a midnight screening um, some years after, and it was packed. Yeah, yeah, I know. I know. Um, I, I, I think there was a, a movie called Holiday Bosses that might have just left this past week, you know. It's funny how long they keep a hold of certain things, but they won't even give... Uh, other uh, other uh, movies to try, you know. So uh, I wish I had an answer to that. Yeah, it, it is really annoying, you know. Uh, thank mm. goodness the Monday Night Film Series does. Yeah, uh, the Film Society kind of has your back a little bit. So yeah, although I don't think they're going to bring in Train Spotting too. <laughs> no, maybe not. Eh? Probably not. But I mean, great soundtrack. Although it's uh, it's hard to think of the soundtrack when you got that image of uh, Ewan McGregor diving into a toilet. <laughs> yeah, that was gross, eh? That was pretty uh, gross. Uh, the uh, uh, I had a, I had a hard time watching that movie, and I and 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 I have uh, I, I've got a strong constitution when it comes to movies. Uh, but uh, yeah, when 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 the baby dies, do you remember the scene? Oh the yeah. Died? Like uh, you know what? As as much as I thought the movie was amazing, I I I, sh- I shut it off there. You know, I I said, man, I'm 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 too bummed. I I I can't go back to this. So yeah. But I but I love the soundtrack just the same. Did you eventually watch the whole movie, or did you not go back? Oh, uh, you know what? I think I did a couple of years later. Yeah. 
but uh, it took me a while. Yeah. Yeah. No, it had so. some that had some good music in it. Uh, oh yeah. Oh no, it had some great stuff. A uh, good combination of new and old. You know. Yeah. But uh, you did do a movie called. Oh, I, uh, I did a few actually. Oh, you did a few movies. Well, a oh, few. Oh, okay. I got a couple. You know, uh, I did Reaper. Okay. Uh, as you've mentioned, that was a fun shoot. Uh, that would have been, Frig, I'm thinking 1997 we shot that, uh, the summer of. Um, the following spring, I did a movie called In Her Defense, uh, which was uh, shot in St. John. Uh, that was fun. Uh, it was uh, it w- wasn't a huge role, but it was a good role. He had some good camera time. He was the uh, dirtbag uh, that sold the murder weapon. Uh, that was the character I was playing. Um, I got to do. Uh, I got to work with uh, Marley Matlin on a okay. couple of scenes. You know, I mean, she she has won an Oscar. Yeah. So, you know, to, to to say you've uh, you've done a couple of scenes with an Oscar uh, winner. You know, that's that, that's kind of cool. Michael Dudikoff was the male lead, kind of an action guy, but uh, definitely uh, uh, stretching his uh, his. Uh, his 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 non traditional role uh, by playing a lawyer, and I saw that guy pull off some amazing courtroom scenes. You know, you wouldn't expect uh, the that depth of acting from someone who is primarily an actor or uh, an action star. Uh, the director of the film uh, that was another thrill. He was uh, a legendary Canadian film director by the name of Sidney Fury. And and he gave me some nice compliments when I was doing my scene. Sidney Fury, uh, he, he's he's directed Brando. He's direct. Uh, he's the director of uh, Lady Sings the Blues. Okay. Uh, he he did. I think he did either Superman three or Superman four. So he worked with Christopher Reeves. You know, the guy had a the guy had a great resume, and uh, it, it was a great thrill to. To, to work for him. It's funny you mentioned Superman three and four. I just had. Uh, I can't remember which one he directed. He directed one of them. Well, January 9th I had um, Jack O'Halloran on here, who mm-hmm. played the big brute silent guy from the first two. Oh, cool! Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I've made contact with Sarah Douglas. I'm hoping to get her on here as well. Wow! From the the first two Superman movies. But, cool. Yeah, but uh, what was it like working with uh, Marley Matlin? What was she like? She was uh, really humble. She was really friendly. Um, uh, she had her, she had her daughter uh, with her, who I I believe was probably preschool at the time. So you know, she uh, had a lot of help there, uh, trying to keep an eye on her as well. But uh, she was very friendly. She was very gracious. Um, uh, I, I enjoyed working with her, you know. Um, and, of course, Re- Reaper, you got to work with uh, in a film with Chris Sarandon, who um, I yeah. think you have mentioned you did not work with him. But, man, I, I love scenes with him, yeah. I love Fright Night. <laughs> it's my favorite yeah. vampire flick. It's it's a good one, isn't it? Yeah, that is a good one. Hey, he was in Dog Day Afternoon as yep. well. Um, Princess Bride. Yeah, Princess Bride. Yeah, exactly. That guy's done some cool stuff. And uh, I did a lot of scenes with uh, Canadian actor Vlaska Varna uh, on that shoot as well. I was the bumbling deputy, and he was like the the old salty police chief, small town police chief. So. Uh, he, I, th- I think he uh, he's worked in a number of movies. I think Eddie and the Cruisers too. He had a, he was in that one. Uh, he's done a lot of Canadian shoots himself. Uh, know, honestly, I I'm, I'm not I'm not even one hundred percent sure if he's still alive. To be honest with you, because that was twenty years ago, and and I, I would say he was probably mid fifties by then. So I'm not sure if he's still around or not. But he was a good actor. I gotta go back there to Fright Night. It's it's weird that movie. If I don't know why they don't release that properly on Blu-ray, because to order that on Blu-ray, it's pricey. Yeah. And the soundtrack is even pricey, and I don't get that. Wow. Yeah. It's extremely Uh pricey, but that had some good music in it as well. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And um, yeah, Fright Night's fantastic movie. 
And Catherine uh, Mary Stewart, you worked with her. Yeah, on Reaper, yeah. I I would tell you, when I, I interviewed uh, her, um, I wish I had this part recorded because when I answered the phone, I asked her how long I had her for, and she goes, how long do you want me for, babe? <laughs> Mine just got goosebumps yeah, well. all over my body. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. She well. is a beautiful woman. Now, well, was she, she was she was a total pro. Uh, but that's what I find about you know these people that uh, that do come down here and 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 get on and, and do shoots in in the east. You know these are usually actors that that they're they're, they're very professional. They're they're very. Uh, they're very prepared that like there's there's no the level of commitment uh that that you see from these people coming down and working on these low budget films uh, it it's 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 admirable you know like these guys come to play and it's uh, it it really sets a good example for everybody you know these guys they don't phone it in like they they they, they really give it their best and and sometimes uh, watching them uh, off to the side deliver a scene, uh, it's 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 pretty cool, because you know there's a lot of riding on, you know a take, you know because we're, we're talking a lot of people uh, staffing these shoots. Uh, film is not cheap, um, talent is not cheap, so you know these people have to be efficient, and mm-hmm. and I I think that's one of the things that I did have going for me when I. Uh, would land uh, roles because I was fairly efficient. Uh, I, I I didn't mess up a whole lot, but um, I was coming from a background where I was in the advertising department, so I was I was very fam- reading copy was was second nature to me, and and memorizing copy and and uh, putting yourself in in in, in certain when you're acting in a commercial you have to kind of put yourself in the moment even though you're you you might be pretending you're you're it's a winter day outside and your car won't start and you but you're actually reading the lines in a in a very nice cozy uh booth so i could i i i, I found my motivation pretty easy uh when it came time to uh, perform because i was used to you know throwing myself into situations like that so I, I think I had a little bit of a leg up. Was Catherine as beautiful in person as she appears on screen? <laughs> very, uh, very natural looking, uh, beautiful. You know, um, you, you get a sense that she probably wasn't anybody that needed a whole lot of makeup. She was just very naturally uh, got that healthy prairie girl look to her. It's, yeah, she's, she's a beautiful lady. Yeah, and Doug Sutherland was in that movie oh, yeah, as well. Doug. Yeah, I I I I like Doug a lot. Doug's a great guy. He he actually uh, uh, he was in uh, in her defense, the uh, Marley Matlin movie that I I, I mentioned as well. Uh, he had a real good scene in that. He had a fight scene uh, in that, and, and and I saw it and it looked good. Like yeah, he, Doug's a good actor. He told me that Catherine Mary Stewart shoots him in Reaper. <laughs> He, he said what? He said that Catherine Mary Stewart shoots him in Reaper. <laughs> yeah, I think she might. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I also interviewed... It's been a D- while since I've seen Reaper, you know, so yeah. I, you, you're probably more familiar with it than I am. I, have you ever seen it? No. Oh, you've never seen it? I think I've got a copy of it here somewhere. Oh, I'd love on to DVD. see it. Yeah. yeah. I'd love Pretty to see it. Pretty sure I do. Well, he... he look for it. He also worked with Dee Wallace on and uh, Killing Ruth the Snuff Diaries, and uh, and uh, I had ran into um, Doug Sutherland. I knew knew that he had uh, worked with Dee Wallace, and mm-hmm. then I discovered just through a conversation with him at uh, the Silverway Film Festival that he had worked with Catherine Mary Stewart. I didn't know he worked with Marley Matlin as well. Well, again, I'm not sure if he was in a scene with her, or but he was in the same production. He was for sure. Wow, and uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, I'm trying to think if he was in uh, Black Swan, which is another film I shot too. Because you got to remember the talent pool in New Brunswick. <clears throat> excuse me. As far as guys that do have like some credits underneath them, um, we're, there's a limited number of us, so we often work together. Uh, a, a guy like Wally McKinnon 
has been in a lot of the same shoots I have. He's a local actor. He's uh, he's done a lot of stage, but he's 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 good in, he's good in front of the camera as well. But uh, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, so I, I know I've at least done two or three shoots with Doug, and I've probably done more with Wally. Well, you know what. Um... I really wish that the government would be get behind the film industry here because, you know, back in the 70s and 80s, we had films like like uh, Black Christmas, which I did a couple of interviews from. Mm -hmm. I've done uh, three. I've interviewed three different people from uh, Class of 1984. Oh, that's a great movie. I, I love, love that movie. That. Well, I had Lisa Langwas and Stefan Arngrum and Mary Lynn Ross on here, and Lisa's manager has sent me a lot of uh, clientele. Wow, cool. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Lisa, Lisa was wonderful, and, and she did the, the Doubtfire Challenge uh, also that uh, that I threw it out to her for suicide and depression. Okay. And um, she she's wonderful, and uh, Stefan Armgrim, uh, also very much involved in music. But, mm. you know, Teenage Head was was in that, and I love you that bet. song, Little Boxes. Mm-hmm. Yep. But... Um, and, you know, I mean, we have the trailer part, boys, which I'm still struggling to get on here. But, but. Oh, yeah. Well, you don't like the trailer park boys? Yeah, I think I think they're funny. I love the trailer part boys. Oh. I'm just trying to get them on here. Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, they're, uh, they're pretty busy guys. Busy with the uh, the reefers? <laughs> well, you know, I, th I think they've got their I, – I, I think they're diversifying into a lot of different things. I, I – but I, I, I think they're fairly busy still. I think being the Trailer Park Boys is still very much a full-time job to the Trailer Park Boys. I love them. I think they're funny. And uh, Hobo with a Shotgun, that was shot. Uh, yeah, um, Rutger here as Hauer, well. right? Yeah, Rutger yeah. Hauer. And yeah. it's like, it's kind of like, you know, it'd be great if we could get back to where we shot movies in Canada like uh, I've had Lisa Lang was on here had uh, Leslie Donaldson on here who's done a lot of Canadian films and of course she's Canadian as well and and I've had various uh, Canadian actors on Lynn Griffin from Bla um, Black Christmas uh, was mm -hmm. in theater in New Brunswick and she said she had her first taste of sushi right here in Fredericton wow you know and uh, I miss it when we used to have uh, Canadian Productions like that, Strange Brew, stuff like that, and yeah, well, the Canadian, the Canadian uh, uh, industry has has it really uh, like uh, you got to understand. I, I'm I'm kind of a little outside the loop as far as uh, as far as uh, acting is concerned. Uh, has has projects slowed down in Canada because out west was always really busy. Um, Halifax always stayed uh, at least moderately busy. It seemed like. Uh, we were getting a lot of productions here in New Brunswick because we were offering a really nice tax incentive at one time. Uh, but uh, I don't know. It, it seems like uh, maybe Nova Scotia and New Brunswick uh, maybe are are competing with each other, and, 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 and maybe Nova Scotia wins a little more because they have more infrastructure set up than we do, perhaps. Uh, I don't know, but... Uh, yeah, it, it was fairly busy here. Like I say, it was busy enough that uh, I I actually considered, well, more than considered, I dove in. I I thought I could uh, come up with enough work uh, to keep me busy uh, throughout the year, and I came close. Yeah, how many films have you been in? Do you know? Mm, uh, feature length, uh, sure. feature length, uh, four, three as an actor. One is a voiceover. Um, actually, two as a voiceover. Uh, I've done, I think, three different uh, film co-op shorts. I did 13 episodes of a TV series uh, that shot in Moncton as well. Um, I don't know. I'm, I've got a few credits, I guess. Okay. Yeah. So, so how... Black, uh -huh. Black, Black Swan was another film that... That uh, I was in, that uh, it, it, it's still out there. You can still find it on on the odd uh, super channel uh, viewing, and I still get a uh, a fifteen or twenty dollar check from them every year, so it must air somewhere. Well, uh, we gotta clarify: this is not the Darren Aronofsky uh, mm -mm, mm -mm. with Natalie Portman. 
No, no, not that one. No, uh, this was shot in, well, I think if my timing is right, it might have been the summer of 2000. Uh, Melanie Doan, uh, East Coast uh, singer-songwriter, uh, she had the female lead. Um, Michael, Frick, what's his last name? Uh, I can't remember the name. Uh, it was terrible, and he was a good actor. Uh, a guy from Toronto had, uh, had uh, the, the part opposite me. Uh, he was excellent to work with, uh, but no, that that one uh, shot down in the St. Martin's area, and uh, it was a good little story. Wow. Um, there was a, a a Bo Derek movie that shot in Fredericton uh, that I had the uh, voiceover part for. I was pretty much uh, the uh, the uh, voice of the uh, smooth uh, light jazz DJ that would be on the radio. When the uh, when the guy's uh, uh, alarm would go off in the morning, like you would hear me in the background, so that was kind of cool. Did you meet Bo? Oh yes, I I, I met Bo a, a number of times uh, because uh, uh, during I I didn't actually have uh, an on camera role on that film, but I did work uh, the production side of it. I was a, a production assistant, which. Uh, which sent me on any number of errands, and one of them, one of those errands was uh, take Bo around, and uh, she wanted to go to Chapters, and she wanted to go to a grocery store. So I had to take uh, Bo Derek around to Chapters to buy a book uh, that she was wanting to get, and uh, she uh, then wanted to go to a grocery store. So I took her to one of those. Wow, <laughs> what was that like? Oh no, she was she was super sweet. Uh, you know, I mean, I was just a driver, so I mean, like, it's not like we get into like in-depth conversations. But uh, she was she was very nice. Um, uh, I, I, I I wish I had more to offer. Uh, I, I I made her laugh. I, I said that she was going. She, she when she was grocery shopping, uh, she was eating very healthy. And we walked by the donut, uh, 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 the cake donut selection. And I said, oh, you should grab some of those too, Bo. You could use some donuts, I think. And she kind of laughed like as if she was not going to buy donuts. She was definitely into smart, healthy food at the time. So, uh, But no, she was very nice. She was super nice, very polite, very, very much a lady. What was the name of that movie? I remember when that was shot here. Mm, Frozen in Fear or something like that. Wow. I'm, try, I'm I'm trying to think. Uh, uh, who was the uh, the male lead in that? I don't remember. Uh, he, he was um, he was uh, he was in a river runs through it with uh, with Pitt. He had a small role in that. Oh, Frig! I'm trying to. Uh, like I say, the, the, we're going back 20 years, uh, and 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 sometimes we're not talking about the biggest names out there. So, uh, Sheldon something. Sheldon, I can't remember. Between her and Catherine Marie Stewart, who would you say was the more beautiful? <laughs> mm, oh, oh boy! Well, you got to remember, <laughs> Bo was probably, uh, probably over fifty by then. Uh, so you know, I mean, and Mary Catherine Stewart, I'm pretty sure it was still in her thirties. Uh, not that that has anything to do with it, but. Uh, um, to, uh, to, no, I, I can't really. I can't really. I can't really say one over the other. I did think Marley Madeline was super beautiful. Okay, yeah, yeah, yes. and obviously, obviously, someone that you know is in, in very good shape and takes care of herself. So, but uh, I don't know if I could. I could say one was more beautiful <laughs> than the other. I don't really, uh, they're 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 all beautiful ladies. You know. Yeah. Well, when 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 she you took her around, it, was she recognized or any? Mm, I think so. I think so. You know, she kind of has an unassuming look. I mean, everybody remembers the, uh, the, 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 the image from Ten with the dreadlocks, and she, yeah. she didn't really look like that. Uh, but I, I, I think a few people recognized her. Yeah. Uh, and, and and you know, kind of the hush turning of heads. Is that, you know, you, the, you can almost see the whispers. But I think a couple of people did. But for the most part, she went through them all fairly much unnoticed. Really. It's kind of nice when they're able to do it. Like, um, like a lot of the people I've, I've interviewed, um, 
it's kind of cool to be able to talk to these people. I've seen them in movies and whatnot. Like I mentioned, Class of 1984. Like I grew up with that movie, and now it's got a whole new meaning to me because I've talked to three people from it. You know? Oh yeah, I get that. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, you you've got a little more of a connection with it now, right? I do. Actually, it's it's strange, you know, because. Um, um, like I said, I had somebody from the Blues Brothers on here. Like it was strange standing in Tim Hortons and my phone rings and you know Murphy Dunn. Mm-hmm. And it's like if somebody was telling me five years ago I was going to be doing this, I would have told them get out of here, you know. Mm-hmm. So it's 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 kind of interesting that I'm able to do this. It's kind of surreal for me. Yeah, it's what, I, yeah. I very much understand. Uh, you know. Whenever uh, on the Fox, you know, I sometimes, uh, well, often I get a chance to interview people that, you know, and if there's someone that's been around for a while, chances are I listened to them when I was a kid, you know. So I, I totally get that. Who have you interviewed? Let's go into that. Oh, my gosh. Who have uh, you interviewed that just really rocked your world? Well, just this past week, I, I, I sat down with Paul Murphy from, from Winter Sleep, uh, the singer for Winter Sleep, and he was fantastic i don't know uh, he pretty pretty much uh, pretty much name a canadian uh artist and uh, that you've heard on the radio in the last 15 20 years and probably i've i've interviewed them uh it, it's quite a list i don't know i bet i've probably done i bet i've probably done upwards to 300 interviews uh over the years you keep them all recorded like I do? like. Uh, you know what? Some of them are here, some of them are there. You know what? I do like to record and, and, and keep for posterity more than the interviews. Is sometimes, uh, uh, often, they'll do acoustic performances. Okay. Uh, along, if they come in to the studio to do the interview, usually there's, a, there's a, an acoustic performance of a song attached to the segment. Uh, or the feature, and I, I do have a, a lovely collection of, of of some of those. Who are some of your favorite Canadian artists of all time? Yeah. Hmm. Well, there's quite a few. Um, you know, I I grew up around the punk era of the '80s, so you know, I like uh, I like bands like the Nils, uh, Doughboys. Uh, DOA. Did you like Teenage uh, Head like me? Oh man, I love Teenage Head. Teenage, Teenage Head are fantastic. Uh, there, there's one that I've never interviewed. Is anybody from Teenage Head? Um, let's see. Uh, man, uh, but you know what? Uh, more recently, I, I, I think uh, the Tragically Hip have had a great career. Yep. I think G- Gord Downey has turned into like. It, it, the, the guy should be our, our highest decorated artist. But, I mean, you can go back to guys like Gordon Lightfoot and Leonard Cohen. I love those guys, too. Yeah, we just you know, lost Leonard Cohen as well. Yeah, yeah, true. Very sad. Yeah. And uh, But, you know, I mean, growing up in, in rural New Brunswick, I, April Wine, Trooper, yeah. you know. Uh, I saw them in concert. Who's that, April Wine? And, and Trooper. Yeah, uh, Trooper was my first concert ever. Well, I grew up with, somebody had asked me, do I remember anything from the 70s? Well, I remember we're here for a good time, not a long time. You don't remember Raise a Little Hell? I remember that too, but I I remember I loved We're Here for a Good Time, Not a Long Time. I just loved that song growing up. It's a timeless song. It's a good time song, for sure. Yeah, and of course, one of my favorite Canadian albums was the Reckless album by Brian Adams. I loved it. Yeah, well, that was a big one. Uh, that, that song "Run to You" is uh, one of those top forty songs I still love to listen to. It's, it hasn't it hasn't it hasn't worn out on me yet. I like that song. Well, you know, we 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 see lots of research on on older uh, Canadian songs, and always near the top of that research, as far as a high scoring song is concerned, is is still "Summer of '69." That's a great song too. That whole yeah. album was great, and I, I remember when it came out. You know, mm-hmm. used yeah. to play the sock ops there at school, and uh, <laughs> and uh, but I remember "Run to You" when the the video came out, and songs like uh, "She's Only Happy Happy When She's Dancing" and and, and yeah. s- stuff like that. And uh, I'm gonna tell you an album I remember, okay. and, and you probably will remember this too. It was a compilation album. I never forgot it because I had so much great Canadian stuff on it. 
Yeah. Do you remember the compilation album, Electric North? I was, I was just going to say, this wouldn't be Electric North, would it be? Yeah, of course I do. Yeah, I had Electric North. It was one of those albums everybody had uh, at the time, it seemed like, anyway. Anybody I knew had it. But yeah, it was it was, uh, it was was a heck of a Canadian compilation for, I don't know, 81, 82, somewhere around there. It was a, it was a real who's who. It was good. It, yeah. I wish they would re-release that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's a, it was a it was a moment of early Canadian pride as far as music was concerned. I mean, that's got a lot of that hard rock stuff on it too. Like, well, like... from the day, yeah, I Rush and Street Hard, and uh, I, th- I think Luba's on there. I'm trying to remember what else was. A Luba was on there. Um, there was uh, Eyes of a Stranger by the oh, Paolas. Oh yeah, yeah, Paolas. Yeah, um, Enough is Enough by April Wine. Yeah, for sure. That cuts for like a knife. Um, I did it for love by Hel- ha- Harley Quinn. Harley Quinn. Harlequin. That was on there, and uh, yeah. you had, um, oh, a Hey Operator. Oh, Coney Hatch, right. I that, forgot about that one, too. Yeah. And uh, I think Fantasy was on there, Eldo Nova. Oh, yeah, I remember that album well. Oh, um, yeah, like a lot of these songs like bring back, back uh, so many memories for me, and I never forgot that album. Another one, um, I'm trying to think of the name of the band, um, Don't You Feel Like Dancing. Um, Headpins. Hip pens, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you know, there was even some, you know, you'd get some weird stuff like Rough Trade on the, on that Electric North album, too. So, you know, it, 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 it kind of, uh, it, it was very wide in, in its palette of, of what Canada had to offer. So, yeah. Cool, there, cool compilation. One of K-Tel's best. I think so. I think they should re-release that. <laughs> yeah, they should, uh, I don't. You, do you ever go on YouTube and 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 search for those old KTEL albums, uh, like the TV commercials for them? Those are hilarious, man. You've got to go back and look at some of those. Oh, they're on YouTube. Uh, yeah, the the TV commercials from the from the seventies. <laughs> With with, with uh, they'd play a snippet of the song and there'd be like the 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 cutout outline of the band from a press still and stuff like that. Oh, it was awesome! You got you got to check those out. They're, they're hilarious. I think I remember a lot of that growing up. Oh yeah, as well. you would. Yeah. I, I I remember there was a comedian. I forget who the comedian was, but he's making fun of these compilation albums that feature a bunch of songs that have nothing in common. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No. K Tel's, uh, I, I don't know anybody whose life hasn't been touched by a K Tel album at one point or another. But yeah, there are a lot of great Canadian musicians like Kim Mitchell. Sure, yeah. I yeah. love Kim Mitchell. Lee Kim Aaron. Kim a great guy. Love Lee Aaron. Yeah, yeah, Lee Aaron. She's still, she's still out there doing it. Uh, she dovetailed into a bit of a jazz career for a while, but I think she's back doing the, the, the stuff that kind of. Uh, um, made her big in the '80s, probably doing the casino circuit now. But she's she's still got a great voice, and she still looks fabulous. I love that song, Metal Queen. Oh yeah, for sure, great song. You mentioned great guy. Uh, you did you meet Kim Mitchell? Met him and uh, interviewed him over the phone. Yeah, he's a super guy. I I uh, remember he used to have that long long hair, and he used to with the ball cap. And was do that mm. uh, easy to tame. <laughs> yeah, he's a cue ball now. He's 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 bald. Now, why would he do a thing like that? <laughs> I don't. Know. <laughs> I, I, maybe it was something he really didn't have a choice in the matter anymore. I think it was starting to leave on him pretty quick. Well, on top, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, but uh, he he actually, uh, I, I think he's out of it now. But for at least ten years, he was an afternoon uh, uh, DJ uh, in Toronto. Like he had a he had a show on uh, on on Q one hundred seven which is one of the, the big flagship stations in Toronto. So, you know, he's, he's made a nice career for himself as well. And uh, I think it was just a couple of summers ago he played Ormocto at the part of their Pioneer days. Super guy. What about Biff Naked? What do you think of Biff Naked? I think the world of Biff Naked. She's got Biff some Naked's great a, stuff. Biff, Biff Naked's an amazing woman. Uh, and, and, and speaking of interviews, she's one of the best. Yeah, I've had I, her. I've had her in in studio, and I've had her over the phone, and uh, she 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 just really sounds when when you're talking to her. Uh, she's got that gift where she makes you feel like she's known you for a long time, and uh, her interviews are fabulous. 
I saw her at the Playhouse years ago. I like that song. I saw that show, I'm pretty sure, yeah. Rich and Filthy is, I think, my favorite one of her songs. Mm-hmm, yeah, yeah. No, um, I, I've, I, I've, I've had a couple of good conversations with Biff over the years. What about Our Lady Peace? Mm, what do I think of them, or have yeah. I talked to them? What do you think of their music? Um, I really like the early stuff. I like The Birdman. Uh, the Witch now? The Birdman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. Uh, I, I post nineties. I think I, I think they've kind of been kind of rehashing the same couple of songs over and over again. It seems like. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in the in the nineties, uh, yeah, they're they're cool guys. Well, Ray Maida married well. Chantal Kravyazik. I I. Yep, that's I'm, right. I'm going to tell you. I've seen her do something I've never seen done before. I seen her twice at the Playhouse. The first mm-hmm. time I seen her, she sat in the front of the stage, no microphone, just a guitar, and I'm going to tell you, her voice just carried. Yeah, wow, that's quite something. Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen that done before, and she was the real deal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, she's a talented lady. Yeah, and we can try to forget Justin Bieber, not a fan. No, nor am I. No, I... It's, but, but, you know, pop music now is kind of, I don't know, it's different than it was, say, when we were growing up. You know, it, it, it's, it's very disposable now. Uh, you know, there was a lot more classic songs that stuck around for years after the fact from the 80s. Uh, I don't see much of that happening anymore because once, once a couple of months are up, that song is old. Nobody wants to hear it anymore, and nobody will hear it again. You know, move on to the next one. It's just like grist for the mills. Keep churning it out. Uh, I, I, I don't think there will be the heritage of songs from, uh, say, 2008 uh, on that will uh, that will last to be uh, songs that will be remembered forever and ever and ever. Uh, I, I think... Uh, special songs like that are few and far between now yeah i think the thing gets me with justin that bothers me like hearing stories about him urinating in a mop bucket i mean that's like somebody's job and it just angers me when i hear stuff like that yeah well yeah it's it's kind of gross for sure like it's just you know it's like he's a snotty rich kid now you know that Mm. that irritates me because yeah Cleaning toilets and cleaning floors is not not something fun for anybody, and for him to do that, you know, like yeah, it's a dick move for sure. Yeah, but uh, I don't know. But we've had some other great Canadian artists, like uh, some that weren't even really in the rock scene, like Shania Twain. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, you got to remember, I, I what would have been like ninety seven, ninety eight. Uh, uh, look at the look at the big female female singers of of that era it was Shania it was Alanis Morissette oh yeah it was Celine Dion it was uh Katie Lang uh like uh, we're, we're talking the, the heavy hitters even internationally they were all Canadian ladies you know I mean it was quite something it was almost like a a, a coup on the female artist category at the Grammys that year I actually heard a joke uh, this year that most of the um, the um, what was it the Grammys uh, that that are the American Music Award or something like that. It was mostly Canadians that won. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, we I, I, we're still turning out stuff up here that you know uh, we're obviously doing something right. We obviously because like. You look at guys like Drake and and The Weeknd and stuff like that. Those are those are big names now, and those are names that are coming out of Canada. And you know, it it, it still impresses me. I, I I like our 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 international profile as as you know uh, a great place where art can be come can can come from. Whether it's you know even in the pop form, you know I I think we've got a great track record up here and 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 still do i gotta ask you um you've probably been to a lot of concerts probably a lot more than me i remember my mm-hmm. first concert was glass tiger way back in the day in the aiken center oh yeah <laughs> yep 
Is that the one that only like 200 people went to? Um, I don't remember. That would have been in the uh, mid to late 80s. Yeah, okay. But yeah. Uh, I was wondering, what were some of the great concerts that you uh, went to and some of your memories? Uh, some of the great concerts? Um, my favorite concert uh, would be the night I saw my favorite band. Uh, that would be The Replacements. Uh, I saw them play in Montreal. Okay. Uh, but uh, like that was just a special night for me personally. Uh, some of the great shows I've seen, I saw David Bowie perform at the Moncton Coliseum. That was pretty incredible. Yeah. Uh, uh, seeing the Stones uh, play their biggest North American date on the Bigger Bang Tour of 2005. Uh, the biggest date on the North American Tour uh, down at Magnetic Hill. That's quite something. Did you see uh, ACDC when they played there? You know what? I didn't go to either of the ACDC shows. Um, I love ACDC. <laughs> I, I, I do too, but you know, I, I, I'll be honest with you. Once I went, once I went to that Stone show, yeah, uh, I, I said I'm pretty much done with the big, big shows uh, because like I was fairly close to the stage, and then I looked back, and as far as I could see, it was just a sea of people, and and I. I kind of got a little claustrophobic there you know I, I said man if something goes bad here like you know there's a lot of people <laughs> that i'd have to uh, uh i i would just worry about getting out quick if something bad happened and and honestly the the size of that show did freak me out a little bit there was like 75 80 thousand people there as much as there was for those acdc shows and 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 that's just a little big of a crowd for me. Yeah. I, I I I did a few years after that go down to see uh, Springsteen down there, and uh, that wasn't as many people. That was like thirty five thousand somewhere in that range. Still, don't get me wrong, still a considerable crowd, but it seemed like it was uh, it was a little more manageable. Well, it was about half the size for starters. You know, it's it's interesting too. Um, um... I saw uh, Avril Lavigne twice in concert, and uh, mm -hmm. when I saw her the first time, it was in Moncton, and okay. I was in the mosh pit, oh, yeah. and, um, you know, I was fairly close. I got some pretty decent pictures of her, mm -hmm. but I'm going to tell you, the, the mosh pit in Moncton was very aggressive. And it was even at an Avril Lavigne show. Yeah, oh yeah, the people were pushing and pushing, really? and uh, it was uh, it, it was it was not fun in the mm -hmm. mosh pit. However, I saw her again mm -hmm. in St. John. I, I had a little thing for Avril Lavigne, so <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can tell. I, I I I I thought I think I thought I always thought she was cute. Yeah, but. Um, I went and I saw her in St. John, and I um, I got some even better pictures of her in St. John. Mm -hmm. But um, it's interesting, the St. John crowd. I remember there was a, a mother standing by me. She was there with her little girl. She comes over, she moves over to me, and she goes, I'm just going to stand by you because you're big. And <laughs> but I remember people started to get a little aggressive, and she goes, I'm here with my little girl. Stop pushing. And people mm. stopped pushing. But I found with the St. John crowd, it wasn't quite as nasty as it was in Moncton. In fact, I went from being five rows back to being two rows back, and I didn't have to push and shove to get there, and I was that close to Avril. Mm. Wow. Um, I, I, I don't, I've never had the live experience of an Avril Lavigne show, so I really don't really know what you're up against on those nights. Uh, but um, I don't know. Um, it, do I find one city uh, more aggressive than the other? No, not really. Maybe it's just the, maybe it was just the night. Maybe it was just who went that night. You know, um, I don't know if I can make that generalization. Yeah, but it's always fun too when there's meet and greets as well. And I, I did you go? Did you meet her? I didn't meet Avril. She didn't do a meet and greet. I, it always annoys me. When, like, she had a, a songwriter open up for her. And mm -hmm. we got a meet and greet with a songwriter, but not with Avril. And I kind of get that, you know, but the same token, it, it, um, you know, the promoters are going to meet her. But yeah, oh, we're yeah. the ones paying the ticket, <laughs> paying for the tickets, mm -hmm. and we're meeting a songwriter. And I'm like, yeah. I, I was very enthusiastic about that. Yeah. Now, well, you know, on the other side of the coin, the promoters are the ones putting up the risk, right? So, you know, that's got to be worth something, too, right? 
Well, I made up for it after that because I remember uh, Hillary Duff played in uh, St. John, and I mm-hmm. actually bought a backstage pass, and I and I, I met her. Yeah, did and she, you like her? Oh yeah, she was wonderful. Was she okay? Oh yeah, that's what I find. It's uh, like these these backstage meet and greets. Sometimes they're 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 fairly you know closely scrutinized. It, it, you, like. Okay, you have uh, you can say you, you can talk for like you have you can give one question and a photo and uh, move on. You know, it just seems like a cattle call to to a degree. Uh, but that's the only thing I don't like about the meet and greets. But uh, yeah, I'm glad you had a good experience. Well, with Hillary Duff, what had happened is that uh, number one, she had a decent bodyguard. He he wasn't a pushover, you know, and he got people kind of to line up, and he he was very good natured. Big mm-hmm. guy, but good natured. Mm-hmm. And uh, I remember um, whoever was in charge was saying that uh, that she wasn't going to be able to sign anything. So you know, so I went up. And I got my picture taken with her. You know, and uh, I think that's my Twitter pic right now. But okay. But uh, I remember after I stood off to the side with others, and I noticed people were getting their stuff signed after that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and I was kind of like, gee, you know, like, I thought we were told no. But I remember when Hillary Duff was being escorted um, away, she walked by us, and I held my CD up with my pen, and she came over. <laughs> oh, really? Well, there you go. She was you really know, cool. Th- maybe that, that non-signing stuff uh, m- might not have even had anything to do with her. That might have been something that her label might have put down or, or, or that her management might have uh, put in the, in, in the stipulations or, or the... Uh, the uh, the waivers or whatever, just because uh, probably it's it's a good way to guarantee that maybe there won't be crowding around the artist. Uh, but if it's if it's fairly relaxed and she feels like signing stuff, chances are she would on her own anyway. Obviously, she did. Oh, she you know? she was great. But like, I heard like bad stories of like Britney Spears, people paying a lot of money to see her backstage, and I guess she's not very friendly. <laughs> Yeah, maybe not. I don't know. Yeah. Have you ever have you ever had any um, uh, meet and greet experiences? Oh, sure, tons of them, uh, and and a lot of them are just like I described. Uh, you know, um, okay, you can have a picture, you can uh, uh, say a quick hello, but uh, you know, move it along. Um, I've helped uh, MC a few backstage things, or or kind of be the station liaison for them. Uh, and 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 generally they run pretty good. Uh, I think the last one I probably did was uh, was George Thorogood here. Uh, I don't know, maybe a year and a half ago. Um, but uh, and again, he had one of those handler guys, kind of like a bodyguard, uh, a good-natured guy, uh, kind of you know preparing uh, the people. Like you know, he's a guitar player. If you're shaking his hand, don't shake his hand too hard. You know, little things like that. Um, but uh, I think it all boils down to who the artist is. Like George Thorogood, he's a he's a, he's a natural entertainer, even when he's not up on stage. He's just one of these guys that he's got a gregarious nature about him. He's uh, he's he's always got something to say. He's he's, he's kind of funny. He's a little off the cuff. Uh, I, I think it really just boils down to the person. And you know, it, it, as far as Britney Spears go. Uh, or goes, you know, it, it's easy to say that maybe, you know, she's a bitch or whatever. Uh, but, you know, we, we don't know what her life is like. We don't, like, she, she's a, she's a, an international superstar, or at least she probably was closer to being a bigger one then. And we, I have no comprehension what their, their life must be like. It, it, it could be like living in a fishbowl, man. It, maybe, maybe it would make you... Maybe it would make you a little cynical. Maybe it would make you a little cold. You know, uh, I, I I really don't know. Uh, I, I'm 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 gonna guess that the glamorous life that we envision of Britney Spears uh, living. I'm sure she's got riches beyond her dreams. But you know, uh, the old saying goes, "Can that buy happiness?" Uh, maybe not. Right. So uh, who knows what their their lives are like? You know, they they're they're being paraded around. They're being led around. They're being told to do this, do this, be here, be here. You have, you know, it's probably not easy. 
Who were some of the, the most thrilling um, uh, artists that you've met in person? Oh, man. Uh, like I say, I've been very lucky to meet some uh, some great ones, uh, in particular Canadian artists, because those are the ones that generally do come through the area. Yep. Um, probably my, my favorite interview of all time, uh, honestly, uh, probably Randy Bachman. Okay. Uh, just... He was uh, he was coming through town. He was playing a show at the Playhouse. Uh, the time I interviewed him, he came in. He was doing a storyteller's kind of a show where you know it's 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 a very low key. It's not a rock show per se, but it's where he's you know got sparse accompaniment. It's mostly just him and then a guitar, but talking about you know the stories behind the songs, and and kind of doing little uh, background uh, in between songs and it, making it. For uh, uh, the ultimate night for uh, a BTO or uh, or a Guess Who fan, because he's got you know both of those catalogs to draw from, and he's he's a natural storyteller to begin with. Uh, he's very very funny, very good natured. Uh, he's got great recall. He's got great memory, uh, and 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 he is uh, a fantastic storyteller. So he makes he makes the interview interviewer. Uh, look good just because he's so prepared <laughs> wow that is fantastic but uh you know um uh i i've interviewed uh alex lifeson from rush okay uh, uh that was a phone interview but but that was a really good phone interview um because you know there comes a, it, it's it's really hard to tell when someone's in the studio with you you've got eye contact on your side and you can kind of you know uh, carry on a more natural conversation when it's over the phone it's sometimes harder to make that connection but uh you know uh when it came down to talking to him uh again great guy really articulate very smart but i i think i must have asked the right question or two because you could automatically feel the or 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 literally hear over the conversation like the wall come down and 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 him opening up a little more uh just because you know he was getting good questions as opposed to you know what's your favorite influences you know tell us about the new album you know th those are pretty standard generic questions uh i think i i i went out i i approached the interview with maybe a little more depth uh and and i think he appreciated that how do you go about preparing an interview mm. It's easier now more than ever uh, with the internet. Uh, you can you can look up any sort of number of things. Um, most times when you're when when an interview is is lined up, it's lined up through the record label. So they'll send you all sorts of bio. So there's lots of stuff to read. Um, but ba basically, if you're wanting to have a successful interview with a musician, uh, it's it's good definitely to become uh, familiar with what they're what they're currently promoting i.e. the new album or or the new tour whatever uh and 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 just do your homework and and everything will fall into place like you know don't just uh answer the phone and 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 just think it's going to be an amazing interview because if you don't go into it armed with uh with some things that you want to touch down on um it, it, it's probably going to fall flat, maybe, or at least stands a pretty good chance. It, it, it's probably going to sound fairly generic. Um, that said, when I when I do an interview, I try not to make it sound like I've got uh, six questions in front of me and uh, we're going to answer them in order. I like to try to I like to try to have a conversation because that's that's when the artist will open up when they're when they're at ease when they're comfortable and when they feel like they're talking to a person as opposed to just a list of questions that someone is barking at them you know uh be prepared uh if you can find some sort of icebreaker you know um use it um n know know the person if you can uh know a little bit about them maybe if you like a great example matthew good matthew good has a real reputation as a really prickly interview 
uh, a lot of people don't like talking to Matthew Good, and a lot of people make me- mention of uh, what a what a abrasive interview he is. Uh, I've interviewed Matthew Good four or five times, and I think he's a total gentleman, and I think he's one of my favorite interviews too. But I'm I, I'm a big fan. I know the music really well, and I also know a little bit about him, and and, and his politics, and uh, and he's if you can kind of like break the ice with just something that you know shows that you care a little bit about the subject and you and and you have taken the time to get to know them a little bit uh that'll that'll go a long ways in 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 making your interview better you know it's interesting because i am going back to class of 1984 when i mentioned i interviewed uh lisa lang was and her manager um mainly many uh represents um musicians and one of the things i like that her manager will do is mm-hmm. he will send me um like a biography thing a little snippet of of their mm-hmm. background and he'll send me some tracks like i just interviewed uh kimberly haynes last week and i didn't know who she was but okay. i would but i was willing to take anybody he sent me because he's a contact out, out of la so i i read what he had had sent me and i i um listened to the the song or two he sent me and I went on YouTube and I checked out some of her other music to familiarize myself and uh, it was nice because I heard from him uh, the following day and he said he had lunch with uh, Kimberly Haynes and he said that she thoroughly enjoyed the interview and yeah. it was nice well, to and, and you he, know you're, you're, very, you're very lucky in a, in a sense that uh, you know you can sit down and, and the interview will take as long as the interview takes uh, me in my uh, situation, um, we try to keep our interviews sh- sh- short and tight. You know, like uh, three, four minutes, probably tops. You know, just get to the get to the meat and bones. But this is more of a more of an in depth kind of. I, I've never quite done an interview quite like this. It's, but it is really neat. It's very relaxed. I uh, uh, yeah, I like that. Yeah. But I'm gonna give you another example. Okay. I um like I might mention I interviewed Murphy Dunn from yeah. the Blues Brothers. That was e- pretty easy because I was so familiar with the Blues Brothers and that I didn't uh-huh. have to do a lot of research to do that yeah. interview. Yeah. But the I I had two interviews that day. The second one that uh Steve Joyner put me in touch with was uh was uh Larry Wilcox from the TV show Chips. Okay. Okay. Now, here's the that'd thing. Be, that'd be Ponch, right? No, Ponch was Estrada. Uh, he was uh, John Baker. John Baker. <laughs> okay, yeah. Cool. You want me to tell you the, the strange thing is? I was nervous going into it. You know why? Why? I never watched Chips growing up. No? Uh, my mom did. My mom was quite excited I had this interview, but I never watched an episode of Chips. Yeah. I had to go on the internet because I didn't want to turn it. I don't like to turn down any interview, but I went down and I checked out uh, his list of credits. And there was, I think the only thing I'd seen that he was in was Loaded Weapon 1, which I guess was a cameo. Yeah, okay. But I went through and I looked through the credits and I, I read up on some of the movies he was in and I took some notes. And um, mm-hmm. I know he's in uh, um, Last Hard Men in 1976 of Western, which I hadn't seen, but, you know, he worked with Charlton Heston and. Mm-hmm. James Coburn and Barbara Hershey. But I'm sure. going to tell you something that stood out to me. And I actually spent a good 20 minutes just talking to him about this. He's a decorated Marine. Wow. Served okay. in Vietnam. Uh-huh. He uh, is a motorcycle driver, so every, all the stuff you see him do in chips, I guess, he did himself. Mm-hmm. He's also a race car driver, and he's a pilot. Wow. And I was well, like... Sounds like you were very prepared for this interview, and he probably appreciated that. Yeah, so I was able to, and I, I, I don't even think he realized I hadn't seen Chips either, because so, I tried to yeah. play it off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but I was yeah. able to do it. Yeah, well, good. Yeah, and it, it, it worked out, and I'll That's tell you awesome, one man. Well, I'll tell you one thing, he, he hates the movie version coming out in March. Oh, there's a movie version of Chips? I didn't know until he said it. Wow, but he said that I guess Dax Shepard and Michael Pena are in it, and uh, uh, they turn it into a raunchy comedy, and he was not pleased. Seriously, yeah, wow. yep. He That's took 
yeah. But that was one of those situations, like um, where I didn't know much, and uh, yeah. But I was able to, and even with that stuff, like the being a marine and stuff like that. Yeah. I was. Well, you able- may not know much about ships, but you knew a fair bit about him. So you know, but at least you had that going in, and maybe that'll take you even farther in an interview, just knowing a little bit about their them as people, as opposed to, you know. As Miss, as as John Baker, you know, uh, that that prob that probably meant a lot to him. Well, you know what? We did talk chips, but I'm going to tell you, I think his enthusiasm was at its highest talking about that stuff because it's uh-huh. stuff he likes to do. Well, that's cool, man. Like he likes to grab the cat by the tail, I guess. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, so that's kind of my approach. Have you have you enjoyed this interview today? Yeah, sure. Has it been any good? I have enjoyed this thoroughly. In fact, I've talked to you for over an hour and a half, and I'm I I, I, I thought it was going to be an hour, but I yeah, like I like the... I, I was worried that you'd get like ten or fifteen minutes out of me. So there, I guess I guess it's pretty good, right? I usually try for an hour. Sometimes um, people can't give me an hour, you know. But um, yeah. and I try to accommodate the best I can. But one of my things I like to do, I don't like to. I, I tell people, you know, an hour would be great. If they want mm-hmm. less, I'll give it to them. But mm-hmm. I like to let people just talk, and I want to hear their experiences. Because when it goes on YouTube, if mm-hmm. people like what they're hearing, they'll they'll listen to the whole thing. Wow. Well, I hope they listen to this whole thing. Yeah, well, I... I <laughs> we'll see. I, I really enjoyed uh, hearing your uh, experiences and... Uh, Oh, th- thanks for having me. How long have you been now? Uh, how long have you been in radio in total? Uh, I first went on the air uh, as a professional uh, in June of 1986. Wow. Um, mind you, first couple of years were on air as a DJ. And then I did 10 years uh, in the ad department. And then I left for a couple of years. So I would say... Uh, Out of the last uh, 31 years, I've been in the business for 29. 29. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Getting up there. That's pretty amazing. It is in this day and age because not many many of us old-timers are still around. Well, Howard Stern's still around. (laughs) Yeah, but, you know, (laughs) he's, 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 uh, he's, uh, he's an enterprise unto himself. He's a... He's the master. He's the king of all media, right? TV, books, yep. radio. You know, if you can if you can spread yourself out like that successfully, you've got her made. Well, I, I've learned a lot from him, but uh, there's a lot of stuff that uh, he does that I can't I can't do too. You know? Oh, uh, totally. I'm with, I'm with you. Um, you know, there there are radio people that I uh, that I probably admire more than him. So, but I mean, like, hey, all the power to him. He's he's done quite well for himself. So who am I to argue, right? Well, I'm I, I'm a Howard Stern admirer, but you know what? He's able to, especially with his success, he's able to dive more intimately and sometimes a little too intimately, and mm-hmm. he 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 can get away with it. And he makes a great interview. Like I, I would yeah. never I'd never compare myself to Howard Stern, but but me personally, I I can't take that. <laughs> route because I don't want to offend my guests. No, no, well, no that, that's cool, man, and and you know, it, I don't think I could do what he does either. You know, just because for the very very same reason, the empathy for the guest. Sometimes he doesn't show any, uh, and and I, uh, it's just not my style either. Yeah, yeah. Well, I hear you there. Yeah. Well, sometime you know, I'll have to uh, get in touch with you. Maybe uh, grab a coffee or something. And uh, yeah, sure, man, anytime. I, w- I, I would love to do that because uh, I thought it was cool when we saw you at the Barry Awards last year. I, I hope they invite you this year too. Well, I, I, I haven't heard, uh, but uh, yeah, because uh, that was the first time I'd seen you. I knew you worked with the Fox, but I had no idea that you had been at CHSR and did uh, did a show. Yeah, like I say, uh, my 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 first radio experience was really at CHSR. So, you know, I I I, I I've always loved the club. I've I've always had a a real sentimental attachment to CHSR. Always. 
Yeah. Well, it's kind of like where it's kind of like you know where I grew up. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, where I also review movies, I should ask, you've seen anything, what What are some of your favorite movies? Oh man, it's been a while since I've gone to movies, to be honest with you. Uh, I, I just got around to watching Deadpool last week, you know, that's how behind I am. I watch a lot of, I watch a lot of uh, documentaries, okay. to, be honest, to be honest with you. Uh, I can't get enough of those. I probably watch more of those than I do features. You know so. what, documentaries are great, yeah. No, I love documentaries. I like, I like thinking I'm, I'm learning something, and and I, that's usually the case with documentaries. I, I usually walk away with something. Did you learn anything from Deadpool? <laughs> <laughs> I learned that uh, uh, Ryan Reynolds has a great self-deprecating de- sense of humor towards himself. I thought that was kind of refreshing. Yeah. Anyway, man, my phone's about to die, dude. Well, you know what? Before you go, could I get you to do a plug for my show? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, what's the name of the show again? Python's Paradise. Python's Paradise. Yeah. What Greg, do you want me to do? Just, Hi, I'm Uncle Rob. Yeah, you can do that and just say you're listening to Greg Gilbert on P- Python's Paradise in uh, Frederick, uh, New Brunswick, Canada. All right. Okay. Okay. Hey, it's Uncle Rob, and you're listening to my good friend Greg in Python's Paradise right here on CHSR FM, Fredericton. Absolutely. Well, Rob, I'll be in touch. All right, man. It's been fun. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, and God bless. Take care, bro. Yep, take care.